hello and welcome class to, at least if you were listening to this in the fall of 2020, our last lecture of the semester. So again, if you are listening to this in the fall of 2020, we will finish chapter 10 in the spring semester. It's going to be exactly what we pick up with. Um, but for now, we are going to uh, just dip our toes into thermodynamics and then we're gonna call it a semester. If you're listening to this in the future, this may or may not end up falling in the fall or spring semester. Or if you're just someone who came across these lectures on your own, you could be listening to this whenever, it's totally fine. Um, but for at least the fall of 2020, this is gonna be the end. So let's lay out some bare bones definitions for thermodynamics, uh, how we consider studying thermodynamics, and then we're gonna call it a semester. So what is thermodynamics? Thermodynamics is the branch of physical science that deals with the relationship between heat and other forms of energy. In other words, every reaction requires some type of energetic component, whether it be heat in or heat out, and thermodynamics is the study, at least in terms of chemistry, uh, for how this heat is observed. So what is heat? Heat energy is the energy transferred between objects such as systems and surroundings based off of temperature differences. So heat energy is thermal energy. It gives off some type of infrared signature. If there is some type of hot object that comes into contact with a cold object, what the hot object will do will be to transfer its excess heat energy into the cold object, as we can see in this next picture here. This is known as heat transfer. So once the adequate amount of heat has been transferred from the hot object to the cold object, such uh, that their temperatures are equal, we will have reached a point known as thermal equilibrium. Now heat energy will always be transferred until thermal equilibrium is reached. Again, this is mostly because once you have reached thermal equilibrium, the temp of one object will be equal to the temp of another object or temperature. And once this occurs, there's no like I know, energetic necessity to transfer any more heat. Uh, once the temperatures are equal, the objects, or I should say the atoms inside of the object are wiggling with the same magnitude of ferocity. Uh, and so there is no real way that energy can be transferred net in one direction or the other. So in science, we always have to define what it is that we are observing or studying versus what is everything else when it comes to heat studies. So the system is what we define as the part of the universe that is the focus of the thermodynamic study. The system is the thing that we are observing. The surroundings, by definition, is everything that is not the system. And when we say everything scientifically, we mean everything. This is everything in the universe that is not the system. So for example, let's say we are observing the cup of coffee down below. Well, how we define the system is also then going to be how we define, as a result, the surroundings. So let's say we want to focus on the coffee itself. This means that the coffee inside of the cup will be the system, the cup itself, will be the surroundings, as well as the table it's sitting on will be the surroundings, as well as the air above it whoop, will be the surroundings, and everything in the universe outside of it will be the surroundings. The reason why we need to define things so, let's say, fervently, uh, is because just like as we undergo a chemical reaction, mass can neither be created nor destroyed, here, as we are studying thermodynamics, energy also can neither be created nor destroyed. So if heat is going into your system, it has to be coming from the surroundings. If heat is leaving your system, it has to be going into the surroundings. And yes, even though like to define surroundings as far reaching as the entire universe seems a little bit like overkill, this is really technically to keep mathematical consistency. Since we cannot create or destroy energy, we have to be paying attention to the flow of heat. Where is it coming from and where is it going to? 
Now again, the system is going to be our focus of the study. The surroundings just ends up being kind of incidental as a way to keep track of where things again are either going from or coming from or going to. All right, so the first law of thermodynamics is what I previously just stated, the notion that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. And we use this big capital U to represent this magnitude of energy quantitatively. This type of energy can only change forms. So again, as we've been studying so far, like uh, with chemical reactions and uh, you know, types of reactions we've kind of kept in the back of our mind, especially when it comes to balancing and stoichiometry, conservation of mass. Now we are also going to have to keep in the back of our mind the first law of thermodynamics, that uh, the definition or statement that energy also can neither be created nor destroyed. Now, mathematically, what this means is that the total energy of your system or the change in energy of your system plus the change in energy of your surroundings has to equal zero. This means that between the system and the surroundings, nothing net has changed, right? If your system has lost 10 joules of energy, the surroundings must gain 10 joules of energy, which means nothing has changed in the entire universe. There's just been an exchange between the system and the surroundings. Mathematically, we can rearrange this statement uh, such that we set system and surroundings equal to each other in some way, and now we can see that there's this little negative sign present. This negative sign is purely directional, meaning that if your system is losing energy, your surroundings have to be gaining energy. If your system is gaining energy, the surroundings have to be losing energy. This negative sign is to make sure, mathematically, uh, that the numbers are going to end up matching what we would experimentally observe. That if one thing is getting higher, the other must be getting lower. Now the energy of the system, since this is what we focus on the most, can be broken down into two different terms. The first, Q, is equal explicitly to the heat energy. The W is equal to the work energy. Now in physics, you end up studying the work aspect a little bit more. So I'm going to leave the work definitions for physics. Now this is not to say that the work component is not important. The work component is very important when it comes to observing the overall energy of your system, as well as the surroundings. The reason, uh, again, I'm solely not focusing on it is because it comes up in so many other discussions elsewhere. We already have so many things to talk about. And the heat component, uh, at least at the general chemistry level, as far as I'm concerned, is where most of the energy of the system is going to be observed. So we're going to be focusing on the heat component. If you would like for or to get a description of the work component from the chemical perspective, the textbook does give a pretty awesome uh, description in uh, like the early sections of chapter 10. However, we have far too much to talk about in terms of the heat component and the variable Q, so we're just gonna keep moving forward with heat in mind. All right, before we get into anything quantitative though, it is further, or it is important to further define the types of systems uh, that we focus on. So we're gonna lay out these different types of systems uh, and then we're gonna call it a day, basically. We're gonna call it a semester. All right, so the first type of a system is known as an isolated system. This is a system in which no energy nor matter is exchanged with the surroundings. Neither energy nor matter. There is only one true isolated system that we know of and it is the entire universe. Our universe, as far as we have been able to observe, does not exchange energy nor matter with anything surrounding it. And it may be a little strange to think about the universe in terms of it being a system because like what other surroundings could there be? But I mean, that's kind of precisely the point. Like if we exist in some type of multiverse system or if there are parallel universes, What's important to observe is that we do not exchange any type of energy or matter with them, which is why we've never been able to observe them. 
the only way that we can observe things, at least uh, scientifically, is either with our eyes through telescopes or microscopes or through touch. If we're observing heat or observing temperature signatures or gamma ray flares or anything like that, we, in observing our universe outwardly, have never been able to detect anything outside of it because we don't exchange any light energy or heat energy or matter with it as far as we can tell. So this means that our universe is the only true isolated system. Now in science, when we are observing systems, like smaller systems, our goal is always to create a system that is as isolated as it can be. This is going to ensure a, uh, let's say, reliable controlled variable. This is going to give us something that's actually meaningful to test. We will never get true isolated systems, but it's always our goal to create as close to an isolated system as we can. These types of systems that strive to be isolated, but technically are not, are known as closed systems. These systems will exchange energy with the surroundings, but they do not exchange matter with the surroundings. Again, these are as close to an isolated system as we can get experimentally. And these types of systems, at least as what we are going to be observing, are used in chem or chemistry to measure energy exchanged in chemical reactions. So in the diagram on the right, we have illustrated what is known as a coffee cup calorimeter which is a fancy juxtaposition of words, meaning that you have made a device with which you can measure the exchange of heat out of coffee cups, basic styrofoam cups. <laughs> the reason why coffee cups, AKA styrofoam cups are so useful is because they have incredibly high uh, like heat capacities. They are very good at insulating heat. So you can uh, add two reaction or two aqueous solutions inside of a coffee cup, uh, and allow them to react inside of the coffee cup. And this coffee cup is going to act as a pretty good barrier to make sure that the heat inside of this reaction or inside of this vessel will stay inside the cup. And it's not going to exchange any heat outside of this cup, at least a very minimal amount. Technically, there will be a tiny amount of heat that gets exchanged with the cup itself and also with the thermometer that is placed inside, but it's going to be a very small amount of heat that is exchanged, at least if you're working with a really good closed system. So the liquid that is present here, this water that is illustrated, is going to hold some type of chemical reaction, whether it be a precipitate reaction or uh, a neutralization. Neutralization or a redox, or another type of reaction that we haven't talked about yet, or a general double displacement, or a combustion, whatever is going on inside of this cup, is going to be occurring inside of the cup, where the thermometer is technically not a part of the reaction, it is a part of the surroundings. And so here we can see pretty straightforwardly how the reaction is not in a true isolated system because it is going to be exchanging energy with the thermometer. So the thermometer is either going to be giving us an increased temperature reading or a decreased temperature reading as the reaction is either giving off energy or absorbing energy respectively. And in observing the temperatures on the thermometer, uh, this is going to give us an idea for how the energy inside of this cup is being exchanged throughout the chemical reaction. So we're going to be looking more quantitatively at the uh, heat exchanges in the next couple of parts in chapter 10, but at least for now, we are defining what is occurring inside the cup as a closed system. Everything that is the cup and outside of the cup is going to be a part of the surroundings. All right, last but not least, we have uh, the definition for what is known as an open system. Now in chemistry, we don't observe many open systems, but it is important to note that we can still learn a great deal of scientific information from open systems. 
Open systems are those that not only exchange energy, but also exchange matter with the surroundings. And in biology, as well as even biochemistry, we can learn a great deal about the human body and the natural world by observing these open systems. Uh, one really awesome example of an open system is that of a cell. So uh, it, you might consider everything inside of the cell to be the system, that's totally fine, but we can see uh, even down here on the like lower right hand side of the cell, we have this illustration of what is being labeled as a secretion being released from cell by exocytosis. Um, which is just a fancy way of saying that the cell is exchanging matter with the surrounding plasma. So cells, in conclusion, right, are a great example of an open system where we can get a great idea for how the cell functions and interacts with the surroundings, specifically by how it is able to exchange energy and matter with the surroundings. So there are three types of systems. There are isolated, closed, and open systems. And for the rest of my class in general chemistry, we will be focusing primarily on closed systems. All right, so here we conclude today with, uh, a, with an example problem pertaining to systems versus surroundings. Um, so I would like you guys to take a break. I know it's been a while since I've explicitly said to like pause the video and like try something on your own because we've been getting through some pretty complicated stuff recently, but I would like you guys to like pause the video and see if you can't identify the following four things uh, as either isolated, closed, or open systems. All right, so let's come together and identify these types of systems and then we can call it a day again. And if you're listening to this in the fall of 2020, we're going to call it a semester. All right, so let's just go through uh, one by one. First, we have a sealed bottle of copper sulfate. Well, this is not the entire universe, so this cannot be an isolated system. It's going to be able to exchange energy with the surroundings for sure but it is a sealed bottle, which means it more than likely will not be able to exchange matter with the surroundings. So we are going to define a sealed bottle of copper sulfate as a closed system. All right, next we have the Milky Way galaxy. So this is a very large thing, a very large system to consider. Despite its largeness, it is still not equal to the entire universe, right? The Milky Way galaxy is just a small piece when we think of the entire universe and what a grand scale that exists on. So the Milky Way galaxy will also not be an isolated system. So our question is, does it exchange matter with the surroundings? Well, there's nothing about the Milky Way galaxy that is explicitly keeping it contained or in any one spot. In fact, we lose stardust and gain stardust, whatever form it might come in, all the time. So the Milky Way galaxy is what we would call an open system. All right, baking soda in a beaker. This baking soda in a beaker, uh, again, is kind of contained within a beaker. It is not the entire universe, so it cannot be an isolated system. Uh, the, the true distinction between what is a closed and open system is whether or not matter can be exchanged. There is nothing that is uh, stated here uh, in this description that says that there's a lid on the beaker. Now the matter may not freely fly out of the beaker, right? It's not gonna spontaneously hover, but if the beaker were to be tipped over um, or if like uh, you're leaving a beaker sit for a long period of time, dust could definitely settle inside with the baking soda. So because matter can be exchanged generally, there's no lid here, we are going to also define this baking soda in a beaker as an open system. All right, and last but not least, canned corn. <laughs> Uh, if we are assuming that this is canned, right, it's not an open can, if we're assuming that this is a canned can of corn, um, it is going to be completely sealed. We can still put this can in the oven, we can still uh, you know, heat it up and cool it down, so it's definitely not an isolated system. Um, but if it is truly a sealed can of corn, we would define this as a closed system. 
All right, and again, the caveat there is that it is unopened. If it is opened, then we could go about uh, providing the same logical arguments as the baking soda in a beaker. Dust could definitely get in. You could definitely spill something. So it would be open or an open system if it is an open can of corn. All right, and with that, we are done with today's lecture. So it may have ended up being less than 50 minutes, which is totally fine. It's a great way to end the semester. Again, if you're listening to this in the future, it may or may not be the end of semester for you, and that's totally fine. So here we have some example problems pertaining to the basic definitions of systems and surroundings, as well as uh, the first um, like law of thermodynamics, that again, definition that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So please work through these if you feel the need to get some extra practice. Um, other than this, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to shoot them my way. If you have any homework, please again, double check and do your homework. And uh, until next time, class is dismissed. <laughs>